Hello, Soundies. Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today's the 29th of uh, March 2020. And welcome and thanks for joining. Uh, we're going to do a grand experiment tonight. I have never live streamed the audio from Audition. So this is, I, I think we've worked it out. Um, but first of all, I guess we just need to make sure that the sound's good for now. We're actually using the Rode NT USB Mini. So this is routed into the computer, separate from the camera, hopefully in sync. Uh, did a little testing there, so hopefully everything's okay. And uh, we'll do our do our best here. So thanks for, for sticking with me. Uh, welcome, everybody. It looks like we've got people from all over the place. Looks and sound good. By the way, Daniel, uh, just north of L.A. I grew up in Thousand Oaks. I don't know if that's near just north of L.A. where you're at, um, but thanks for joining we have interested party from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, let's see, Jason, happy Sunday, friends. <laughs> Welcome, and we have Zach from Palm Beach. Alejandro is joining. Sean is joining here from Las Vegas. Tom Filer from Lawrence, Kansas. Brian Scanton from Los Angeles. And. Let's see, Trevor from Ontario, Canada. All right. And, oh, and, and we have Facundo from Argentina. Sync looks good. Thomas Donalek, thanks for joining. Jamie, thanks for joining from Tokyo. And uh, Daniel is in Valencia near Magic Mountain. Very good. I went to Magic Mountain as a kid, had a good time there. So uh, thanks, everyone. We have Klaus from Denmark. Uh, Hansa, Hansang from New York City, Lorana Nation from Vancouver, uh, Jamie was born in Culver City, that's cool, my cousins, uh, my aunt and uncle and cousins live there in Culver City, right near Los, uh, LAX, actually. <laughs> uh, Rob's coming to us from Canada, Jonathan from Dallas, uh, we've got Edgar from Pasadena, we've got a good, good contingent from the Los Angeles area today. And we do have Peter from Hamilton, New Zealand. So, all right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining. Let's jump into uh, a little demo here. Now, I'm going to need uh, just confirmation as we do this. There were lots of, like, uh, sample rate coordination issues I had to do, and hopefully this works okay. But I'm going to show Adobe Audition, and in particular, we're going to demonstrate a new plugin sent over to me from a fellow by the name of Benjamin and Benjamin, I think, is the guy behind this plugin. It, it's called the company's called Accentize, Accentize, um, and the plugin is called VoiceGate. So it's a denoiser for voice uh, recordings, and so it works a little bit differently than some of the others you may be familiar with. Evidently, it uses um, neural networks to identify the sound you want to keep versus the noise, and then reduces the noise from there. So that's the idea behind it at a very high level. <laughs> and um, so let's go ahead and switch over and see if I can get this to work okay here. So we're going to pull up Adobe Audition. Adobe Audition is going to complain that it needs to make sure that everything's okay. We're going to say, okay, you're all right. Come on up, Audition. There we go. All right, so here's where I need everyone's input on whether this is working okay. Uh, you can probably hear my mouse moving around. I apologize for that. Um, if, uh, if you can see Adobe Audition, and actually I'm going to play a little bit here, and let, just let me know if you hear this okay. Be my daughter speaking. Nope, didn't like that. Okay, let's go back into the hardware preferences. Switch to that, switch back to this. See what we go. You'd think one would never run out of things to say, but once asked to say things, I can never remember the most important ones and thus end up saying no things when I do, in fact, have things to say. Okay, so you should have heard my daughter's voice there uh, babbling some sort of nonsense. <laughs> and then... Um, we do see Adobe Audition. Okay, that's good. Um, and then at the end here, what we did here is this is a this was a an intentional recording where we turned a fan on in the background and then had her just read a little dialogue here, little line. 
and uh, you can hear the, hopefully you can hear the fan in the background. Here's just the fan. Okay. We can hear it. All right, we're gonna we're gonna go for it. Here we go. Um, so, what I want to do is let's go ahead and pull up the VoiceGate plugin here, and this is VoiceGate here. Let me just run you through some of the controls here really quickly, so you can see what it's all about, and we will then kind of run this audio through here and see what we get. So, VoiceGate, as I mentioned before, is a plugin that denoises. It's main mainly for voice, uh, both dialogue and, you know, spoken word voice, and also for singing voice. And it has a couple of different modes. But before we dive into the modes, there is this one thing right here where it uses a variety of different algorithms. So we have one here for lavalier, one for anti-drums, one for inverse. I don't know what all those do yet. That actually just literally came out, I believe, in the last 24 hours. <laughs> so I haven't had a chance to dive into those. But the interesting thing is, is that this is cool because you can choose specific algorithms that are fed sample audio and develop models to denoise specific types of sounds. So that's uh, that's that looks pretty promising. So we'll be diving into that in more detail over time as as um, you know as we can. There's a broadband mode which basically just operates on the entire frequency spectrum. So you can see here represented down at the bottom we have our low frequencies on the left, higher frequencies over here on the right. And then the uh, y-axis here represents how much attenuation it's doing at each of those frequencies. You can also go into spectral focus mode. So if you want to break it up into three different sections, you can do that. And then you'll see the controls triple down here at the bottom. So you can apply different amounts of denoising to different parts of the spectrum. And you can actually move these uh, to some extent here. So I can move this one from about, I would say, 400 hertz up to about 2.5 kilohertz is my guess there. And then this one goes down as far as probably three kilohertz and up to somewhere around six or seven kilohertz. So you can do that as well. And this is this is really useful if you know where the noise is sitting in terms of the overall frequency spectrum, then you can kind of fine tune it and just have voice gate work on that part of the spectrum where you know the noise is. So that's kind of a cool feature. Um, but you can go in this very, very simple mode as well, which is the broadband mode. And then you have two different types of denoising, what they call steady noise and impulsive noise. And <clears throat> these, I, I'm not sure I entirely understand. I, you know, I would have thought that fan noise, for example, would be considered steady noise, but I'm actually finding that the impulsive noise works better with it. So what you may consider steady noise versus impulsive noise may not be what you intuitively think it is, but in any case, what is recommended in the documentation, which, um, by the way, a lot of plugins come without documentation. It's really nice to see some software or, you know, like a plugin that comes with documentation. Um, and actually, before I go any farther, I should say it does work with, um, we've got it working here on a Mac in Audition. I'm using the Audio Units plugin. It also works with uh, Reaper. Pro Tools, uh, Live, I, and on, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. It works in Logic. I have Logic now, and I confirmed it worked in Logic. It worked in Pro Tools for me. I believe one of these is Studio One, and one, I don't know, and probably one is, I don't know what the others are. But it does work in a variety of different digital audio workstations. I have not tried it in Fairlight yet, so not sure on that. We'll have to give that a, a go. Um, then it kind of just walks you through the audio interface, or the user interface, but what it does also here is kind of outlines. I won't bore you with all the details, but basically it's saying almost always start with impulsive noise. That's a pretty good place to start. Start with it at 50% sensi sensitivity. And uh, if you leave it at just the default of minus 12 dB or reduction of 12 dB, that's a good place to start. So here's something I'll do. I'm going to go ahead and play through this audio again. And this time I'm going to turn the bypass on and off so you'll hear it processing and then not processing and then processing just so you can hear what it sounds like with and without the plugin. Let's see where we get here. You'd think one would never run out of things to say, but once asked to say things, I can never remember the most important ones and thus end up saying no things when I do, in fact, have things to say. Yeah, 
You'd think one would never run out of things to say, but once asked to say things, I can never remember the most important ones and thus end up saying no things when I do, in fact, have things to say. Okay, so you can hopefully hear that there. And uh, that was one of the more transparent dialogue denoising plugins I've heard. Um, it did a pretty nice job. Didn't appear to leave a lot of artifacts in her voice, but let me go ahead and run through it again here. I'll just crank up the sensitivity here. So if you lower the sensitivity, it is going to do less noise reduction. If you increase it, it will do more. Oh, you can go 120%. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> I didn't know you could do more than 100%, but evidently you can. So um, let's just go ahead and play through and let's crank this up just to see what it sounds like. You'd think one would never run out of things to say, but once asked to say things, I can never remember the most important ones and thus end up saying no things when I do, in fact, have things to say. Interesting. So um, that was interesting. It, you could definitely start to hear some artifacting. It, gets, it starts to get that kind of wooly sound, um, almost like she's talking into a pillow. Uh, so... But it was actually, even at the max setting, it was a little bit better than I expected. Usually on a lot of those, when you crank it way up, you'll just get this underwater or this kind of woolly, I'm talking into a pillow sound. And uh, this seemed to hold up pretty decently. So um, in any case, that I was pretty impressed with that one. So let's look at a different sample here. Uh, I, I was actually, and this is, I was just playing with this this afternoon. So I have, I'm not sure. And Benjamin, I don't know if you're on... Benjamin, if you are on the live stream, if you wouldn't mind piping up, we do, I, we'd love to have you answer some questions here. Um, and I don't see anything from Benjamin yet. Um, but in any case, so let's go ahead and pull up another one. So one of the things I thought I saw, so this is a, this is a recording of me with a lavalier microphone, and I'm intentionally creating um, clothing rustle. So I hit it underneath my sweatshirt here, and kind of moved my arms around. I didn't. I didn't hide it well. <laughs> I intentionally made it so that the jacket would sort of rub against the microphone. This is what it sounds like. Clothing rustle can be a real problem. So here, it's a lavalier microphone. We're getting a little bit of that clothing rustle sound. Okay, so you can hear what that sounds like. Now, one of the things I thought here was, well, wouldn't that be cool if this voice gate, we can go into these different modes. Let's put it in lavalier mode. Okay, now it's in lavalier mode. Let's see what happens when we run through that. Again, we'll just use the impulsive noise at its default settings, and, and I'll, maybe I'll tweak those around a little bit. Let's see what we get. Clothing rustle can be a real problem. So here, it's a lavalier microphone. We're getting a little bit of that clothing rustle sound. Now, if I don't move, everything's fine, of course, but if I move... Let's come back and play that again here. We are engaging the plugin. Clothing rustle it actually did did some. So this is this is not the greatest recording. I just realized that it's I, I didn't just realize, <laughs> but it's not the greatest recording, um, based on where I hid the microphone underneath the jacket. But in any case, so it already sounds muffled from the start, even when I'm not using the plugin. So the plugin affected it to some extent, but it also did manage to reduce some of that rustle a little bit, which was I was a little surprised by. I didn't expect it to do anything there, but it did a little bit more than I thought. Um, oh, here, here we have Accentize. Okay. Um, you are here. Okay, thanks so much for joining. So I'm curious if you could speak to the, the algorithms are kind of intriguing, and I'd love to know a little bit more about them. For example, the Lavalier algorithm, is that intended to help with clothing rustle, or is that uh, intended to help with the fact that most Lavalier microphones are omnidirectional and therefore are going to... I, I mean, I'm just curious. I don't... I, trying to kind of figure out what, what, what's unique about the lavalier algorithm. And um, also I'm curious about the inverse as well. I'm not sure, anti-drums I assume is probably more for 
uh, when you're tracking music and you may be actually recording, tracking drums and vocals at the same time, I would guess. I'm not sure. But in any case, I'm curious, especially about this lavalier algorithm. If you could speak to that, that would be awesome. All right, and he, uh, Benjamin has also said that it probably will already work in Fairlight. You can try... Okay, so exactly. Lavalier is for de-wrestling, and you can try um, VoiceGate in Fairlight. So we'll give that a try as well. All right, cool. So there's an example with the lavalier. Now, this is a trickier one. So I have some discontin what I call discontinuous noise. So... Okay, and then inverse just eliminates voice. Okay, so if you're trying to remove maybe vocals from a instrument recording, maybe that would be um, something you could use that for. So here's another recording. This is what I would call discontinuous noise. I'm kind of banging on things in the background while my daughter reads a line. Let's see what this sounds like. You'd think one would never run out of things to say, but once asked to say things, I can never remember the most important ones and thus end up saying no things when I do in fact have things Okay, so <laughs> you can hear there's a racket going on back there. Let's go ahead and pull this up. Now, this is this is not something that I've seen any denoiser really do a great job at, and I'm not sure we can realistically expect this to do that either, but let's just give it a try. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with the default impulsive noise settings, and let's see where we get. You'd think one would never run out of things to say, but once asked to say things, I can never remember the most important ones and thus end up saying no things when I do, in fact, have things to say. Hmm, let's You'd try think again. one would never run out of things to say, but once asked to say things, I can never remember the most important ones and thus end up saying no things when I do. Okay, so it's actually, it is working. Um, of course, there's a fine line. There's always a fine line about, uh, you know, between how much you're going to start cutting into the dialogue that you want to keep versus eliminating the noise that you don't want. Um, when we went up on the sensitivity here, you could, you could hear it starting to do that effect to her voice, but we, we could probably find a kind of a sweet spot between the two where it wouldn't completely eliminate those discontinuous noises in the background, but it could help reduce them so they're not quite as distracting. So pretty interesting here. I, I like the user interface from the standpoint that it's pretty intuitive, pretty straightforward and how you know how you can use it. So there's a quick look at VoiceGate. Now the as I'm as I'm as I understand it, um, there are supposed to be additional algorithms coming here in the next little bit. So as um, as Benjamin has more source material to feed into the neural network, um, that'll that'll be able to help um, develop some new algorithms that will potentially be helpful. So I'm pretty hopeful. This is looking pretty useful so far. Certainly, I would say that getting the just the fan noise on that first sample, that was a lot easier to kind of dial in the amount of reduction I wanted to do and not impact the voice or the dialogue nearly as much. You know, it, it seems like... Um, even, even on, um, like Isotope RX, which is excellent, it seems like there's kind of a fine line you have to kind of process through it and then undo if it was too much and then redo again. Um, you can also run through it live if your computer is able to, to do it as well. But, um, it seemed this was pretty, I don't know, it just seemed pretty easy to get to that kind of fine line in between too much versus not enough. So, um, anyway, so there is a look at... Voice gate. So, Benjamin, keep it up. That seems like uh, we're, we're you're making some great progress there, and I'm really excited to see how that turns out there. So, all right. Okay, let's jump into our questions next, and let me just pull those guys up over here. We had some that were submitted ahead of time, so we'll take a look at those first, and then we'll come back and uh, grab the others as well. So, let's get our keynote going here. All right, uh, let's go back up to the top. Here's a question from Thomas. Uh, I need your help concerning the NTG3, which cracks from time to time. Typically everything sounds fine, then I record crackling sounds for one to three seconds. It's rather rare, but still annoying in the middle of a good take. The setup is the Rode NTG3 on a stand connected by a Mogami cable with Neutrik XLRs. I've done the welding myself, but it looks decent. Then Fethead Phantom preamp to a Tascam DR60D Mark II, which provides phantom power. The latter is powered by a power bank through USB. The noise appears more frequently and lasts longer when there are no internal batteries 
in the DR60D Mark II. Interesting. I wonder if it might be a known issue or if the mic should rather be sent back straight away for replacement. The cracks sound a bit like intermittent power disconnection or just like when one rotates a button in those good old analog circuits. Could Wi-Fi waves or cellular phones cause the sounds? Could it come from the cable? Is it definitely a power issue? The USB cord might be at stake. Thanks to everyone waiting to hear your advice is be well. So um, <clears throat> my initial thought is uh, I would simplify your signal chain in as much as possible. So I would get rid of, uh, not, not get rid of it, but take out the Fethead Phantom. Just remove that for the time being, just to eliminate a possibility there. And then I would work through the signal chain. So if you have uh, a different recorder or input you can connect the, the MTG32, that would be the first thing I would try. I would try different cables if you can, just to, to eliminate that possibility. Uh, and then, let's see, the MTG3 needs phantom power, so the, so the Tascam has to provide it. That's in that particular signal chain. That's how it has to be done. Um, it appears more frequently and lasts longer when there are no internal batteries. And so, yeah, then I would also see if you ever get it if you're just using internal batteries. Now, I realize the Tascam DR60D Mark II doesn't last a long time on internal AA batteries, but just as a test, eliminate the USB battery bank altogether. It sounds like that does make somewhat of a difference. I would then sus potentially suspect the um, the USB cable between the battery bank and the Tascam. So the idea here is just take your entire signal chain, microphone, cable, recorder, USB cable, USB power power bank, um, and simplify it as much as possible. Get rid of the stuff you don't have to have for testing purposes, and then swap each of those out in as much as possible. So um, it could be helpful if you, um, obviously right now, I don't know where in the world you are, but most of us need to be staying at home most of the time instead of going into guitar centers or other pro audio outlets. Um, but when if you do have another cable, I would certainly change that out and test that and simplify the, uh, the signal chain as much as possible. So hopefully that makes sense, Thomas. I don't know if anyone else has other ideas too. Go ahead and drop those in the chat. We would love to hear your input as well. So hopefully that helps. All right, next up from Clayton. So let me give you some background on Clayton's question here. <laughs> a couple of questions, actually. He sent me an animation. The, the link is down below. I'll, I'll put that in the, con or the description after the, the live stream here so you can actually hear it. But what we're getting in the audio on that is sort of a phasing effect. So in rather than just getting a mono recording of dialogue or voiceover, we're getting this sort of phasey kind of thing. And this is this is the basis for Clayton's question. I used an Audio-Technica AT2005 USB hooked it to the computer via USB. Do you notice kind of a reverb phase sort of sound going on? And the answer is yes, I def definitely noticed it. What's interesting is when I record directly into a Mix Pre 3 with the same mic, that issue goes away. In an attempt to get around the USB issue, I used the Mix Pre 3 as a USB interface. Side note, I'm pretty sure it was going to let me record 32-bit float audio into Audition. The issue here is was it seemed to only send the audio to Audition. It would not send the audio through to Character Animator. I want to hook the mic up to the computer directly via USB and not have this goofy sounding issue if possible. All right, so we'll stop there. That's the first question. Um, it sounds like when you have your Audio-Technica 2005 connected directly via USB to your computer, there's some sort of loopback going on because what's happening is sending the same audio back into Audition uh, at a delay. And so that's why you get that phase effect. So I don't, it, you, I don't know if you have anything like Audio Hijack or other kind of loopback software things running, but you'll want to check that. And also in Audition, I would make sure that you're just recording a mono channel and just choose a single input. So that can that can also fix that issue potentially as well. Don't try to do any, if, I don't know if you were, but if you were trying to do a stereo or uh, track or anything like that, just, just go back to mono. It's just dialogue and you can add stereophonic effects later if you want to, but it sounds like you're trying to get rid of those <laughs> in the first place. That is my suspicion based on the fact that when you use it through the Mix Pre 3, it works fine. So the Mix Pre 3 probably doesn't have some sort of loopback thing going on. So that would be the first thing to check. All right. I'm not sure about Character Animator, though. I don't know how 
can't, I've never used Character Animator. I don't know what it works, how it works in terms of receiving audio. Um, but that's probably something I, I, I'm afraid I just can't help with that. But if anyone else has information on how to get audio, you know, stream it from Audition into Character Animator, that'd be great as well. All right, next question. Another interesting issue I found is that my Rode Wireless goes when hooked up to the H4n, Zoom H4n, I, I assume, make crackling and popping noises if they are connected to the XLR ports. So just to kind of connect some dots there, I believe that if you're doing that, you're probably using a Rode VXLR adapter to go 3.5 to XLR. And I have found that those sometimes have bad connections. So that would be my first suspicion here in regards to the crackling and popping that you're getting. However, if it is connected through the eighth inch jack on the back, it's fine. That would also support my suspicion. Interestingly, the inverse happens on the Mix Pre 3. What is that all about? Balanced versus unbalanced connections? Ooh, um, I suspect something's going on with the adapters would be my guess, but I, yeah, but I don't know. This is, again, this is another one where you wanna narrow down the signal chain. So are you saying the inverse happens on the Mix Pre 3 that if you connect the Rode Wireless Go into the 3.5 millimeter input on the Mix Pre that you get crackling and popping noises? That would suggest a connection issue too. That, that's typically where those crackling and popping noises are. They're usually, it's not usually a balanced versus unbalanced thing, I don't think, not usually. Um, the crackling and popping is usually a loose connection. So that's the that's what I would check for first there. So again, you're gonna have to check cables, check adapters um, and things of that nature. And sometimes if an adapter doesn't fit tightly into an XLR port or a 3.5 millimeter port, that's uh, that that kind of stuff can happen. And sometimes the cable is bad just after the connector. That's usually a sign, if you're getting that crackling and popping, that's usually the sign that there's something that's not quite um, fully connected <laughs> inside the, the cable. Often it's right near the connector. So hopefully that helps, Clayton. Thanks for the question. All right, J.H. Brooks asks, since you're talking about voice gates, can you also review the voice gate and its use in DaVinci Resolve Fairlight? Um, I am not positive what you're talking about. I'm not sure if you're talking about a like a gate expander here in more general terms, or if you're talking specifically about the denoising plugin we just looked at. But uh, I I will be testing that in DaVinci Resolve, so we will come back to that. So thanks for that question. It's a good one. All right, next up, Klaus. I'm currently working on starting a podcast and thinking about getting the Rodecaster Pro. I know the USB connection can be used as either sending multi-track to a computer or playback from the computer, but can it do both at the same time? I believe the answer is yes, Klaus. Playing music or sound effects to the podcast via the Rodecaster and then back again to be recorded in the computer. Yeah, you can certainly do that, I believe. Um, yep, that, that is possible. Definitely with the pads on the Rodecaster, it's possible. And even if you played them from your computer, um, yeah, I believe it can send those back as well. Second, I'm also considering maybe a Zoom F8n or a Mix Pre instead, but I'm not sure if it is possible to do interviews over the phone with a Mix Minus. The answer is yes, it's possible. And in fact, that's the thing, I think a lot of people make this a little bit more complex because they've heard of this concept of a Mix Minus. A lot of the apps that you would use to record over the internet remotely, um, they automatically do that for you. So you don't even have to do any sort of fancy routing or setup on your audio interface. They'll actually take care of that for you. So it's not that big of a deal. Clean feed is a great one. Um, even things like Skype take care of that for you. So not a huge deal there. So yeah, you could definitely use a Zoom F8n or a Mix Pre. The Rodecaster Pro is such a perfect product when it comes to functionality and it's even pretty portable, but with the Mix Pre, you can do a lot of other stuff too. Yeah, it's a tough call. Um, I would though, my preference if I could only choose one, to be honest, is especially if you have to do fast turnarounds, I would probably choose a Mix Pre and get the Mix Assist plugin. That's my own personal preference. It's more expensive than the Rodecaster, but um, it does definitely simplify things, especially if you have to turn around quickly. The Mix Assist is a really fantastic feature for podcasts. It really, really works well and it saves a ton of time and gets you just really great results. So that would be my personal preference. Um, so there's a thought there. But if it's important for you to play back jingles and stingers and you know intros and outros and stuff like that, um, 
I th you can do it. It's going to take a little bit of uh, routing setup. You may need something like, again, Hi Audio Hijack Pro or something like that, but you can definitely make that happen as well with a Mix Pre or a Zoom F8. So you got lots of options there, Klaus. Hopefully that helps. All right. <clears throat> Well, this is actually a sound for video session, but we did have some quick questions on lighting. Let me just run through this quickly. Number one, LED panel, Aperture Amran Tri-8 or Lightstorm 120D, and in general, LED versus COB. Okay, so a COB is an LED. It's just a point source versus a panel. Um, and then Alex goes on to say, for my use case of shooting interviews on the go, obviously it is easier to use LED panels, but I'm concerned for the quality and may have more scenarios in the future like documentaries. Well, documentaries are a lot of interviews, and so I think a panel is a great choice for interviews. Um, so it just depends on what you want to do. Uh, you're right. A COB takes more work to get a big softbox set up and get a nice soft light for a key for an interview, and it takes up a lot more space, so you can't fit it everywhere. Um, so there's some downsides, and I've found myself on corporate shoots where I do a lot of interviews using panels more and more. Uh, so that's just a thought, just from my perspective. Mine's not the right perspective. It's just a perspective. Number two, why everywhere we see Aperture? Are they that good? Should I consider other brands? There are complaints on the quality of the Amran Tri-8 panel. Um, I didn't have any problems with my Tri-8. Um, I actually don't have it anymore. I gave it to my brother because he needed it for a shoot. And um, so he's got it. It still works as far as I'm aware. It worked fine when I had it. Um, so I don't know what these complaints are about quality. I know that my experience has been that Aperture is pretty good. If you do have a problem, they'll use you, they're pretty good about supporting it. My brother had one of the AC power adapters go out on one of his original Aperture um, LS1s, and they just sent him a brand new. Actually, they sent him an entire new light <laughs> with the AC adapter rather than just the AC adapter, which seemed a little wasteful, but they got the problem solved. So the reason you see them everywhere is that they're super aggressive about sending them out to YouTubers. That's why you see them everywhere. Um, the YouTubers aren't buying them for the most, I mean, the YouTubers that are reviewing them initially generally are, they're given to them for free. So that's why you see them everywhere. All right, now you talk about the Lupo LED panel versus the Aperture Amaran Tri-8. So we're talking about a huge difference in price here. I think the Tri-8 is less, I think it's like $500-ish. And the, L the Lupo LED panels that I've used are all north of $1,000 US. So we're in completely different leagues here. Lupo is definitely a more, um, Aperture as a company is really trying to appeal to self-funded independent filmmakers. That's really what they're trying to do. Lupo, uh, but although I think they're trying to move up market some too. I think some of their more recent COB lights are much sturdier, the 300D Mark II really pretty impressive light. Um, but some of the earlier ones were not necessarily as robust in terms of their build quality. So that's one thing you're going to see the difference between the Lupo and the Apertures. I use my Lupo LED panels for corporate shoots all the time now. They're actually my main light that I take on the corporate shoots. So that's something to consider. What brands do pros use for lighting equipment? They use Lupo. They use uh, Aria. I mean, it depends on what kind of pro they are too. If you're, if you're talking about big budget, you're going to see a lot of Aria lights these days. Um, if you're talking about corporate shoots, you're going to see a whole s bunch of different things. Um, I'm lucky because Lupo has sent me a variety of different lights. I find them really, really useful tools, and I use them in most of my corporate shoots. Um, I haven't bought any of the Lupo lights. Those were all given to me in full disclosure. <clears throat> but I also have a bunch of aperture lights sitting around here, and I have an option. And what I almost always end up doing on the corporate shoots is taking the Lupos. Not 100% of the time, but a lot of the time. Um, so there are some thoughts there. Hope that helps, Alex. And thanks for the questions. Okay, we're going to hop back over to our camera here. All right. Let's take a look here and see what we've got. Uh, over here in the chat, I've heard a lot of activity. Um, all right, Trav, Trevor said, let's go ahead and just start in here. So I've tried a number of things to denoise when I record in refineries, but since there are so many noise frequencies in play, pumps, compressors, flow through pipes, I'm finding it near impossible. That is a tough environment. And when you have a broadband noise like that, whoo, that is tough. Now, what was interesting if we, um, when I look, actually, let me come back over. I'm just going to take a quick, quick peek over here. Then fan noise was not entirely broadband, but it did 
creep up into, it was all the way down below 100 hertz, and it crept up to about, I'm seeing some harmonics even up into the 2.4 kilohertz range. So it wasn't entirely broadband, but it was pretty wide. I mean, that's that's quite a swath. And um, I don't know how it'll work. There's a free trial, so definitely give it a try and see how it goes. All right. We did get kind of confirmation that, well, not confirmation. There's a free trial, so <laughs> if you're interested in trying that. Um, and by the way, uh, Benjamin gave this to me. I didn't pay for this. Um, there is a price. It's uh, 80 some euro, as I recall, at the site. Um, but we just we, that's we're doing a demonstration here just to see how it works. I'll continue to use it over the next little while. And we'll probably come back and take a closer look at it before too much longer. So, all right. Mark says if it's real neural networks, I'd be interested to know what has used uh, as training data and if it's incorporating the user's own choices into it in terms of what settings they use. That's fascinating. So I don't. I know that there was some training data, of course, but um, I don't know if it feeds back into the actual plugin itself and then feeds that back to Accentize. I don't know. Not sure. Will it work with something as simple as Audio Hijack? I don't. I didn't know Audio Hijack could use plugins, so I'm not sure. It's a great question, Daniel. Um, I'll have to take a look at that. All right. Mark, if, is it being trained on identifying specific noises noises in isolation and then zeroing them in uh, zeroing them out or comparing polluted source source audio with human best effort at fixing? Good question. Okay, it has been fed with se several noise types and learned to zero it. All right, and then okay, cool. So th there's there's a lot there's there's more there. <laughs> there's probably more to learn there, but in any case that's that's uh interesting there. So Alejandro, are you familiar with the Rastorter fold up carts? If so, do you know where I can buy one in the US? All I know is they're manufactured in Australia. I'm not familiar with those. Um I have heard of the uh one one kind of mini cart that's become very popular are the um Zuka, Zuka carts. They're actually Zuka bags. The first time I was ever exposed to Zuka bags is that my, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my daughter used to do Irish dance and we'd go to these all day, you know, and actually all multi-day uh, dance competitions. And a lot of the, the dancers would have these Zuka bags, which are these kind of like roll behind bags that you can fit a lot of stuff in because they have these big um, solo dresses and wigs and all this other stuff that they use. So um, but I haven't heard of the rest orders, so I'm not sure. Um, I'll take a look and see what I can find here. All right, Hansang. Uh, love your channel. Have a Rode VideoMic NTG and Sony A6400. Does it matter if I send the audio via USB to PC or to the camera? Would it make any audio difference besides not having to sync to audio sources? Um, it could, because in the case of sending the VideoMic NTG to your computer, it's using the VideoMic NTG's analog to digital converter. If you go into the Sony A6400, you're sending an, um, an analog signal out of the Rode VideoMic NTG into your camera, and then the camera is taking that, reamplifying it, and converting it to digital. So I would do an A and B test, just set it up, do two recordings, one directly into computer, one directly into the camera from the NTG, and see what you get there. <clears throat> it's... Uh, Testing is a critical thing to do, so always do your own testing. Never trust what someone tells you online. <laughs> Even me. Uh, so uh, that's what I would do, uh, just to kind of kind of dial things in for yourself there. But there is a difference. Uh, the question is whether it makes a difference or not, and what works easier for you. All right, Mark is asking a little bit more about the neural network and the learning um, says, do you have some sort of adversarial system set up to identify clean audio and then test the results of the noise reduction against it to see if it has done a good job? Great question. Uh, Trevor, to Clayton, echo Curtis's comments on the VXLRs. I had the same problems with the VXLRs with loose connections. So definitely something to check. And then Trevor goes on to say, I bought some XLR kits that you can solder your own wire to, have a low profile and work perfectly with my road gear. Okay. 
So that, that's uh, brought them bought them from cable techniques. So there's a, an option there. And if you, if you are, um, if you do have the skill of soldering, <laughs> you can make your own and potentially solve that problem. Um, I've had two Rode VXLR adapters that have come apart in my hands. Amazon replaced them, but I'm looking for a good alternative. Okay, yeah, me, me too. I'm, I, 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 well, no, not me too in terms of them, mine falling apart. Mine have not fallen apart, um, but I have not run into any issues in terms of the crackling and popping. So I haven't had issues with mine yet, but it sounds like several people have. So if anyone has uh, some good alternatives there, we'd love to hear from them. Uh, Curtis, do you know if VoiceGate can be used for Logic Pro? It can indeed. I tested that today, in fact, and yes, it does and can. All right. Sean says, Klaus, share the links to your podcast when it's ready. I agree. Let's hear what you come up with here. We're looking forward to that. Speaking of podcasts, um, some people have asked over the, the years to, um, for me to post my videos as in a podcast form as well. Um, where it makes sense, at least, and and we've started doing that. So if you're not aware, um, I do have the Learn Light and Sound podcast. It's available on Apple um, and a lot of other different networks too. So if you go into your podcatcher app and you look look for Learn Light and Sound, hopefully you'll find it there. And that's another just another way to listen to them if you're interested in that. Okay, Klaus. So thanks thanks so much for your answer on the Roadcaster Pro. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. All right. Uh, Daniel James says, I have two of the 300D Mark II lights and love them. I agree. That's, I feel like Aperture's quality has improved pretty, I mean, it's always, it's always been decent with a few weak points. Um, now it feels like it's gotten really, really solid. The 300D Mark II is a really solid light. Um, it's tough. It's built for production work use. And so, um, I'm pretty impressed with that. So, Amran line was definitely their more consumer line, and so that one's not going to be as tough. So going back to the lighting there. All right, Mark Owens, F6 regards time code tentacle. I could not get time code fixed. Put a mono plug on the tentacle sink side. F6 time code out right channel. Tentacle looks left channel. I connected. We have time code. Okay. I'm confused, Mark. Is it working now or is it not working now? Um, the mono adapter worked when I used it for the pocket cinema camera. Um, but I'm not. I'm not really clear on what you're saying here. If if you're still having problems or if it, if that solved the problem for you, let us know. Definitely here. Uh, am I the only one hearing a pop like a text message notification? Yeah, you are not the only one hearing that. <laughs> to get audition, to get audition so that I could, so you could hear it on the live stream, you were also hearing the sound effects of new comments being posted in the chat. So that's what you were hearing there. So I apologize for that. I'll, I'll look for a way to um, eliminate that in the future. And Sean confirmed that he heard those too. So, and so does Daniel. And so does Peter. <laughs> uh, Alexander, 5 a.m. in Israel. That's dedication. Hope you're doing well there to Alexander. Stay safe. All right. Um, yeah, if you won't hear them in sync with the pop, the pops in sync with the comments because there's going to be some latency between when they show up here and when they get broadcast out. So that's normal. All right. <clears throat> uh, Benjamin confirms, no, there is no data collected and sent back to the servers. So they're doing all the learning on, in the development end of things, not sort of a live feedback kind of situation. All right, Laurent, how's everyone doing uh, with everything so slow? That's a great question. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, since our last live session, uh, things have changed pretty dramatically for us here. I'm in Summit County, Utah, which is Park City and the surrounding area. And we are on a stay-at-home order. We cannot leave home except to go get medical services, grocery shopping, um, or fuel for the cars. Uh, and I think you can go to the hardware store as well. But otherwise, you're supposed to stay at home. That has been uh, – that's a challenge for anybody. I think even introverts have it. <laughs> 
most introverts probably i'm an introvert and i still have problems with that i mean not problems but i felt a little stir crazy a little cabin fever um but on the other hand i think it's been good in some other ways and it's been really good for my little family here we've had an opportunity to work on some things that we've never been able to do before just due to lack of time and coordinating schedules so hope everyone's finding ways to make this work okay as we uh kind of wait out the pandemic here so <clears throat> All right, Hansang is going to try out the do a little test there. Let us know how that goes and report back. We'd love to hear. All right, Tulio is coming at us from uh, Brazil. Cur uh, I don't know Portuguese. I've been there a couple times. Cur Curitiba. Not sure if I said that right. All right, Laurent, trying to figure out what to do to keep busy. I've been listening to podcasts and studying gear. I think that's getting to know your gear is a great thing to do at this time if you've got a little more spare time at home absolutely um, a great thing to do. And I've gotten lots of questions actually via email, people saying, hey, I've got, I've had a little more time to kind of sit down and dig into things. And so we've gotten a lot more questions. Hopefully that's something you can do as well. Mark apologizes for the overly nerdy questions aimed at Accentize. Those are great questions. Don't apologize for that. All right. Um, Dibuhe. Maestro. I apologize. I don't know what that means, but thank you. <laughs> All right. Rob says, my concern as a Fairlight user, this is regarding the VoiceGate plugin, as a Fairlight user would be that you folks aren't thinking of Fairlight as a market, and so I could be left out if there's a change down the line. And then he goes on to say, that said, I'll sign up for your email list, and if you folks decide Fairlight is a DAW you're interested in supporting, I'm definitely interested in the product. Okay, and we have good news from Mark. He confirms that after using the mono, mono adapter, uh, that it worked. That is great news. Glad to hear it. Good job solving that problem, uh, and good good job everybody. When you when you have a problem, definitely think in terms of signal change. Start from the very start of your signal chain. That's generally going to be your microphone, and work your way through any piece of that entire signal chain could be the source of the problem. You just need to narrow it down and figure out which one it is. So good job, everybody. All right. Accentai says we will test if it runs without problems in Fairlight and let you know. And good news, that one's free. So you don't have to pay to do that test just in, in terms of time. But um, all right. Trevor, I would spend more time making new videos, but all my lights are 2,000 kilometers away back home in Nova Scotia doing my part and staying inside. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Rob says, thanks. Oh, Daniel James works for an essential industry company, so things are actually pretty crazy at the moment. So thank you for providing essential services, and I hope you stay safe and well and healthy in that process. So, so yes, I am in quarantine here um, just because we've been, everyone's been ordered to stay at home. The problem we had here, so... The, the largest town in our county is Park City. Park City is home to three different ski resorts. The ski resorts stayed open quite a while. And of course, as a ski resort town, there's tons of restaurants. And uh, i not blaming anybody, but there was a doorman at one of the restaurants who tested positive. And so, of course, there were probably hundreds of people that came in contact with that person um, over the course of the time when he was, in, you know, contagious. Uh, he or she, I don't even know who it was, but in any case, um, our infection rate per capita was was uh, rivaling those in the, kind of the hot spots in Italy. And so the uh, Summit County uh, Council and the public health administrator and everyone decided, you know what, we have got to stop this now. So that's how we ended up in this situation. Um, now I'm not, again, the problem is, is the ski resort stayed open and so, and the problem with the ski resorts is that people come in close contact. I mean, I know it's an outdoor activity, but when you have those, you know, five-seater chairs and you have the gondolas that are enclosed, that seat six, um, people are in tight quarters right next to each other. And so it looks like we've, we've passed a good bit around. So, all right. Uh, Laurent, great point. I'm glad you brought this up. I've forgotten about this. Gotham Sound is actually doing free rentals so that you can get to know gear. Um, so the idea is you have to pay for shipping, but if they have something available that you want to try out, you can pay for the shipping. They'll rent it out to you. 
you can get to know it and then ship it back. Um, so you pay for all the shipping, but it's a really great way to get to know the piece of gear, whether it's a microphone, recorder, mixer that you've always wanted to try. So definitely some cool things there. All right. Uh, Sean points to another denoiser plugin. I haven't used it, but my father-in-law did it did to separate voice from background sounds. Uh, let's see. I didn't see the link to it, Sean. Um, if you could just let us know which plugin that was, that would be cool. All right. Mark, what would be a good mic for the pre when recording outside doing narrative around drones? Ugh. Drones... Drones make beautiful visual shots, I get it, <laughs> but they're horrible for sound. Um, you might try a specialty mic. I know Sankin has a mic that, that has, I think, three different capsules, and it uses the additional capsules to basically eliminate sound from the back. It's more um, effective than a typical cardioid would be, and I don't remember what the model number is, but um, if you look over on the Sankin site, you can probably track that down. It's, it's basically a shotgun microphone, but it's designed to be used indoors as well. So it doesn't have the tail on the back and it rejects from the back. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be very focusing. That would be my best, my best recommendation. Um, but the reality is, is recording around drones. I don't know of a great way to do it. So um, in any case, th th there's a thought there. Um Robert is uh, catching up on retouching a thousand art reproduction photos, posters, mainly for a museum client. That's fantastic. That's a great way to spend your time when you're at home. Um, Zach, I did a conference recording gig at Snowbird a few years back, not too far from you. Walked down the mountain on my last day off. Very good. Yeah, it's a beautiful area. Um, yeah, love living here. Absolutely love it. All right, uh, love YouTube. Getting advice directly from an expert on the most esoteric comment or topics. Thanks you for putting in the time. Some are experts but can't teach. And you're an awesome teacher. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. All right, Scott is looking for a backup boom pole. Let's let people in the chat here give some advice on this. I don't know what your primary boom pole is. I don't know what your budget is. But... Um, I would, uh, so so here's what I've, my experience. I, I did a piece of a while back. I compared K-Tech polls with some Really Right Stuff polls. Um, interestingly, a bunch of people got angry about Really Right Stuff because they had, they've been politically active supporting some movements that people weren't supportive of. Uh, back on the California Proposition 8 days, they were against, against Proposition 8, I believe. I can't remember, uh, for, they were against. They, they weren't supportive of gay marriage, in other words. So they've, they contributed a significant sum of money um, to try and prevent that. So um, just so you're aware, if that's important to you, um, there's that. <laughs> um, but I've been really happy with my K-Tech Avalon Graphite poles. They are very lightweight. They're super sturdy. They've never failed me. They work, they just, they work beautifully. I've been happy with them. Um, my boom operating friend, um, Alan Williams, who works in the industry, uh, he lives in Atlanta. He uses the, um, uh, which, which, what are the poles he uses? Uh, they're, they're carbon fiber poles, ambient, uh, that ambient makes them. They're not cheap, but they are very good poles. Now, if you're looking for something a little less expensive, the road boom pole is an aluminum pole and it's decent. Um, I would probably look at the K-Tech aluminum poles before I would look at the, the Rode, just because the Rode, it works okay, but I didn't find the knuckles really easy to work with relative to the knuckles that you have on the K-Tech poles. So I preferred the K-Tech poles. So that's that's what I would look at, Scott, if that's helpful for you. And again, I'm not sure what your budget is or what you're trying to accomplish, you know, which, which range you're trying to work in. But uh, anyway, there's some things there. Mark. We have some small alcohol companies making hand sanitizer to health standard because it's so short here in Australia. Also helps them uh, in quit time of alcohol sales. Oh, okay, interesting. All right, yes, Rob, the uh, the Gotham Sound rental is really a cool thing. 
a good mic to use around drums would be a shotgun. <laughs> Double barreled mic. Uh, I I get what you're saying. No, but they they do make brilliant um, shots. I think really, the I, I'm with Scott on this. Is when you're when you're talking about drones, you're probably going to have to do some ADR or something like it. Um, all right. And Laurent, back to the Gotham Sound Rental. Yeah, it's a great way to learn different mixers that you wouldn't be able to study otherwise. I have a Mix Pre 6, so I would like to study the 888, the A10, and a digital slate. That would be a fun combination to get it and, and get some hands-on time with that. <laughs> Mark also says a shotgun, as in a gun. I can't make a noise if you shoot it out of the sky. All right, so Scott, on a budget of 500, you should definitely be able to get into the entry-level K-Tech poles, even if they are the aluminum. But I think even some of the, the smaller, I have a, my backup is a K-Tech, a shorter K-Tech pole. I think it's only like nine feet, but it was 400 and some dollars. And it's the graphite pole, actually, not, a, not an aluminum pole. So that's what I would look at. Um, again, I'm using the, they have the classics and the, K, and the Avalons. I would probably look at the classics, to be honest, but... Um, some good stuff there. Laurent also uses K Tech and has been pretty happy with them. Uh, if you can't ask nerdy questions on the Curtis Judd audio, you can't ask them anywhere. That's the truth. And we got a great community to, to answer them for you, too. For me, this is the best time for me to get on top of my audio job. So when things get better, I'm fresh and ready. I agree. It's a good thing to do. Oh, Michael, Michael Wynn. Thanks so much for coming. Um, the Senken CS3E. And it does have an excellent off axis and rear rejection. Also, the three capsule design decreases the loss of low end at greater distances. Okay, so there's a CS3E, but there's another one too that was a more specialty one that I tried. I, I got a chance to talk to the guys at NAB, and it wasn't the CS3E. It was another one. I mean, it was a it was a little bit different. Um, but yes, the CS3E is is probably of a lot of the shotgun microphones out there that a lot of production sound mixers use. And from my understanding, that one has one of the more focused polar patterns. And I didn't know that about the three capsule design also um, decreasing the loss of low end at greater distances. That's cool too. So that, that's great info. Thank you so much, Michael, for that. Really appreciate that. And uh, thanks for joining us tonight too. All right. Uh, and then finally from Norm, if moving to a professional receiver transmitter, would you wait a bit for more digital options like the A10? Well, I would love some other advice from other people on this too. I'll share my opinion. My opinion is <clears throat> um, I I have been really happy with my A10. Now, I am not doing the types of things that Michael Wynn's doing. I'm not doing 10 channels of wireless. I'm generally doing two. I've done a few with five channels of wireless, but generally I'm not doing a ton. And the A10 system has been great. Um, when you get to a lot of channels... Uh, managing things just becomes more challenging for sure. And I would love to be able to, to try out the Zaxcom system where it's all tied into the mixer, where you can control everything from the mixer, all of the transmitters, all of the receivers from the mixer. That's really cool. Um, but I, I just, I don't have the money to do that at the moment. Maybe I need to rent, uh, some Zaxcom gear, excuse me, from, uh, Gotham Sound while we're all uh, sort of isolated here. But uh, that those are some of my thoughts. I Yeah, I really like the digital system. The sound quality that comes out of that Audio Limited is fantastic. I'm really, really happy with it. I don't have any major complaints about it. I wish I had the ability to control the transmitters remotely. And I do have the Bluetooth app, but I have to be pretty close to the talent. But it, what it does at least is it allows me to control it without having to unbury the transmitter. It'd be nice if I could just control it from the mixer instead. <clears throat> and the reason they can't or haven't done that on the audio limited system and all the, uh, a lot of the other systems is that Zaxcom has a patent on that. So here in the United States. So yeah, I think uh, I think a digital the digital pro systems are really really they're I I've been just delighted with my A10. So those are my thoughts on it. I don't know what else to say. Um, well, the other thing that's really nice about it as a digital system is that. Um, I can go into my mixer directly digital. I don't have to do the whole uh, analog to digital conversion at the transmitter, transmit it, convert it back to analog, and then into the mixer, 
then convert it from analog back to digital. So now I can just go in digital directly. And so that's a really nice thing as well. All right. So there's some thoughts on that. Coming back to Trevor, I was just about to buy a K-Tech carbon fiber pole, nine or 10, 12 footer, just before everything went wonky, holding off now until work gets back to normal. I think that's probably, I understand. <laughs> and um, yeah, I've been happy with my K-Techs, pretty good. Is it okay to do YouTube videos with me and a talent? So max two people. In the context of the current situation, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, well, I don't know. I, I can't. <laughs> I'm on. I'm, I'm ordered to stay at home. So for me, it's me and my family here. We can all be in the videos. And in fact, my daughter and wife have been helping out, helping out with a couple things. Um, the video coming up next week will be the review of the Rode uh, NT-USB Mini. And they did a lot of the testing for me. So, I mean... They were, we used their voices to do a lot of the testing. So that's, yeah, I'm not sure if that's what you meant, Laurent. I, I would still keep, keep doing the social distancing. Important to do. I don't know if that's what you were asking. Sean asks, who is Michael Wynn? Michael Wynn is a production sound mixer in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Um, he was here a few minutes ago. I don't know if you're still there, Michael. Um, but uh, yeah, he's he's got a great channel on YouTube. If you haven't uh, checked it out, I would definitely recommend it. He covers a lot of topics that are relevant, especially to professional production sound mixers. So some great information here. Okay, Greg comes through. The Sankin CSR2 rear rejection shotgun. So I think that's your best hope with drones. Uh, thanks so much, Greg, for pulling that up. Appreciate that. And um, so that's one to worth worth looking into. I'm not, I'm not saying that's going to solve all your drone problems, um, but... That's the first one that came to my mind as a possibility. So something to consider there. Kind of a specialty tool, it seems like. Norm says, thanks. Well, thanks for the question. And then Ron, yes, current situation. Yeah, I would I would probably not. Um, I'd, I'd keep doing the social distancing thing. I think it certainly, it, it's been a very harrowing experience for us here because the infection rate just went, it just skyrocketed, went logarithmic really, really quickly. And it's a relatively small community. So it's a little bit scary. So I think it's better off just to, to isolate for now. All right. Since video capture boxes are out of stock everywhere, do you recommend just waiting and getting the ATEM Mini? Um, you know, I was looking around and doing a little bit of research on that. There are other options out there. Um, there are other switchers that you could use and then just feed that through a conversion box like, like an AJA or an Elgato or whatever. Um, so there are other options out there. The A10 Mini is working for me, but I'm not here to say that it's the right tool for everybody. It is it is really convenient, though, I will say that. Uh, what I like about it is that I've got four HDMI inputs. I've got, uh, that'll go USB-C to my computer, so it converts all of those for me. Um, it doesn't send the ISOs out. It just sends it one at a time, and you or you can do picture-in-picture. And then it also has an auxiliary uh, HDMI out. So I've got a little monitor down here that I can look at just so I know what the ATEM is sending over here to my computer. Um, and it's got a couple of cool features like, you know, transitions. I I've never used the keying because I don't key. I don't do green screen here. Um, and then of course it's got the audio inputs and so on and so forth. So overall, it's just a convenient box. It works. I think it's a good choice if that fits your needs. But there, if you really are needing to get something quickly, um, there are other options out there. And I need to do more research, but Roland actually makes some switchers. Now, they're not cheap. If if budget is also a factor, that's the nice thing about the ATEM Mini. It's really kind of made for YouTube streaming, to be honest. Um, they call it an ATEM Mini, but <laughs> I wouldn't think that there are a whole lot of TV studios using something like this. I could be wrong. But I think they're trying to make a some capability, some some functionality for people that have much tighter budgets that are doing self-funded types of live streaming situations like this. So I think it's a great device. It's worked great for me. I prefer it over the AJA conversion boxes, the UTAPs, or the Blackmagic mini recorder. This is so much better. Those always, like it took 15 minutes to kind of get them working and you had to disconnect all the different connections and reconnect them and hope it worked that time. And this one, I plug it in and it works every time. So it's been really good. 
All right. All right. Let's see here. Let me get back to where we were. So that's Travis. Travis, I hope that helps. Uh, I know I ramble sometimes, so. Uh, Sean says, cool. Thanks for joining, Michael. And I agree. Thank you. Ah, interesting. Norm, if investing into a new pro recorder mixer, would you consider Dante a must-have? Not for everybody. If you're if you're doing small time stuff, um, no, I don't think so. I think a mix pre even could do the job. If you're if you're getting into much bigger productions where you're going to have a lot of inputs, that's where I think it's going to be important. Um, so yeah, in those circumstances, and you're doing it as a full time job, then it probably makes sense for your next mixer to have Dante. I would say. So. Um, it, it's really about moving lots and, and having more flexibility in terms of routing audio um, around from different devices and to other devices. So yeah, there's definitely, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It makes a lot of things a lot easier in terms of running cables for very complex types of setups, but it's not necessarily um, a critical thing for much smaller jobs. So don't, don't, uh, I don't think it's necessary to get super hardcore and, you know, buy way beyond your, your needs. Um, even if you have aspirations to eventually do something like that, I don't think it's necessary right up front. So hopefully that helps. <laughs> uh, Michael Wynn, just like Curtis, is an eminence. Well, there you go, Michael. Um, and he's still here. Thanks for the plug. Also, we typically never record dialogue... Uh, while doing drone shops. Maybe big, wide masters, but that wouldn't get used in editorial for dialogue with a drone shot. Yeah, that's generally been my experience as well. I've I've always, we've never recorded audio, really, with a, with a drone shot. Uh, okay. Laron, here's, a, here's an interesting one. Booth Junkie did a video today. He did a clean feed demo with one of the clean feed principles. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Bad microphone technique, apologies. Uh, yeah, that that's great. Clean feed is a really useful tool, especially in today's world. So good info. Thanks for that. Adam, there are tons of Elgato HD60s on eBay if you really want a capture card. You can resell it again in a few months if you like when the ATEM is back in stock. That's great advice. Um, Elgato uh, capture cards are or they're just little USB capture devices. Good choice. Good option. Did you get your start in corporate video by freelancing through corporate media companies or just build up through word of mouth? Um, word of mouth mainly for me. Uh, I didn't go through corporate media companies. I, I did it word of mouth. And I'm small time. I'm really small time. I don't want to misrepresent. I am not like a big name out there <laughs> in terms of corporate video. Um, I actually have a day job where I am part-time software product manager, part-time videographer. So, And then I do freelance jobs. Um, that's all word of mouth. That's all been built up over time as I've gotten to know um, the various production companies and people at production companies in my local area and um, just started working that way. So that's, that's, that's my background, Trevor. All right. What's a good way to work out the milliseconds delay between a camera and a mic? I'm losing my mind trying to sync an A6400 through a cam link and a USB mic. Clap test. So Mark, what you're going to want to do is do a local recording via OBS or whatever streaming app you're using or whatever recording app you're using, do a clap, bring it into post into a video editing app and just run it. You'll hear it. You'll generally hear the audio first. When you hear the audio on that frame, just go one frame at a time, counting each one until you see the visual clap. That's how many um, frames. And then you'll do the calculation for milliseconds. So if you, you know, you'll have to figure out your frame rate, that'll tell you how many milliseconds each frame is. And then, then you'll know at least roughly how far off you are. Hopefully that makes sense. You're a smart guy. I'm pretty sure that made sense to you. <laughs> and then Travis says, thank you. That helps. All right, people. Thanks so much for joining. We need to wrap up tonight. Um, we will be taking a closer look at VoiceGate in the future. Thanks again to Benjamin for, for joining us here on this live stream and answering some of the questions and also providing the plugin so we could do the demonstration. We'll put it to more use, hopefully get it running in Fairlight as well, or, or at least test to see if it runs in Fairlight. 
and uh, we'll have more information on that in the future. So get out, don't get out. Actually stay in, learn your gear, make some great recordings, and we'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.